You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I'm David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled, propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to see some tips or hear some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests each week. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. And also, I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching, and you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com or by email at david at thatgratitudeguy.com. And those show notes, those contact information will be in the show notes as well. So let me get on to what is always my favorite part of the show, which is introducing my guest. Certainly no exception this low energy, wait a second, high energy guest I have today who is always one of my favorites to talk to, Dee Dee Bays. Let me tell you just a little bit about Dee Dee. Dee Dee Bays loves helping highly successful, very passionate people use their money in a way to express their deepest held ideals and values to honor their soul. She is an expert in financial planning who has worked with thousands of households since entering the business in 2007. She offers a unique approach by combining soul-based financial planning and sustainable investing to help people honor who they truly are. She received her undergraduate degree at the educa- in education from Oklahoma State University, as well as completed postgraduate work in the area of psychology. She spent a decade and a half teaching in the public school system, first as an elementary science teacher, then moved to middle school mathematics for the majority of her career. When the pandemic hit in 2020, she, it was a catalyst for her to re-examine her life and what truly made her happy. She was working at a credit union at the time with over 650 clients in her book of business. She felt her life was out of balance. She commuted an hour, worked eight hours, commuted an hour home, and able to work in the evening on financial plans. Went to bed to do it again the next day. She was becoming exhausted and felt she had way too many clients to give them the care they truly needed. So she took a leap of faith and started her own firm with the intent of not only having uh, more than, not not having more than 100 clients total and giving them the care they deserve. Didi, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited. Well, I'm excited to have you. You've got quite a story, which I happen to know, and I'm anxious to have the listeners hear not only a little bit about your story, but also how gratitude and a gratitude attitude impacted you throughout your life and so on. But my first question is always the same, just to give the, leader, the, the listeners and the viewers context, is how did you and I meet? Uh, we met on LinkedIn. Uh, we have a, we are in a, a, a mastermind together and we're both trying to learn LinkedIn to grow our businesses and that's the way we met. Yeah, and it's been it's been quite a mastermind, I might say, not only meeting you, but a number of other really neat people. Uh, one of my favorite terms to always use is like-minded people that really have the same vision. And just in reading your bio, and and uh, I didn't go into even more detail on it, but just soul-based uh, financial planning and wanting to help people uh, get connected with their soul and have the value and how money works for them. So let's go back a little bit, because as I know, as I mentioned earlier, I know a little bit about your story, but but kind of walk us back, maybe back to the beginning, Oklahoma State, and after you finished and you were in the school system, talk a little bit about how that impacted you, at least initially, as you started your career forward. And then I know you obviously went into planning, but how was that first half a dozen, dozen years for you in the school system? You know, I honestly felt, well, let me back up and tell you why I got my degree in education. I didn't grow up wanting to be a teacher. Um, I grew up wanting to be a good parent. Um, And I knew, I mean, I didn't know what good parenting looked like. And and I knew that growing up, my teachers always seemed to know uh, the right things to say. And they were very compassionate. And in my mind, they, they would have made 
absolute wonderful parents. So I actually got a degree in education to learn how to be a parent. Um, and then while I was there, I set out to just get a, a general elementary education degree because I love children. But while I was there, I discovered that I actually had an aptitude in math and I was able to test out of several courses um, without taking the class. So um, anyway, I decided to, to you know, go into the public school system. And honestly, I was very, very fulfilled there. Um, while I was teaching, you know, my husband was uh, in the education system as well. He was a physical education teacher. We had two children. We all four had the exact same schedule. Um, it was just a, a wonderful time in our lives. And I felt that my gift to my students was um, that I tried to say their name every day and I tried to look them in the eye. And even though I had 140 students you know, in a day, I usually, I, I tried to make sure that each one of them felt a, you know, special to me. Um, and so I felt like I was living my purpose at that point because I feel like I, I have a, lo a lot of love to give people. And um, I was able to nurture those middle schoolers uh, for about 15 years. And Near the end of my career, I started becoming just a little tired. Um, I had gotten to the point where I felt like I was pretty much at the top of my career. I was, um, I was being a, I've lost the terminology now because it's been a while, but I had student teachers come in. I had uh, students from the university that would come in and observe my classroom. I would help mentor first year teachers. Um, but there was, a, I was just getting tired. I was getting, you know, and there were more demands on educators and we were going through, uh, this is when the school shootings started just really popping up. And I just started questioning, it's like, is this really what I want to do? I'm not sure anymore. And I, I felt like I lost a little bit of my fire and I never wanted to be that teacher in the classroom that was bitter and angry and felt they that she felt trapped and then she took it out on the kids and I felt like if I couldn't give you know my students the best version of myself I, I didn't need to be in the classroom anymore so I did a lot of soul searching as far as well what do I really like to do and what are my strengths and it came back to numbers and people I, I enjoy working with people and I enjoy working with numbers and so I actually left the classroom in 2007 and started my journey in the financial services industry um, at New York Life. And so it was like, okay, numbers and people in the financial services got it. And I started there and it just, I, I learned quickly that I didn't really like it because it was really more sales and it just, it wasn't what I wanted to do. I, I enjoy working with people. I enjoy teaching people. I enjoy listening to people, but I felt like in that capacity, I was more a salesman and that's just not who I am. And then after I left New York Life, I went to Allstate and I became, I got property and casualty license in addition to my um, health and, and insurance licenses. Um, and there I was, I was pretty happy for a while, but then I realized it just wasn't quite all working for me. And eventually I ended up, after Allstate, I ended up at a little boutique firm where the owner was a CPA and a CFP. And part of her firm was bookkeeping and taxes. And the other part of her firm was wealth management. And I was on the wealth management side. I ended up getting securities license and I just couldn't get enough of the financial, um, the financial component to it. So I ended up uh, starting my journey to become a CFP at the time too. And it was like the bell or the, the lights went off. And it was like, this is what I want to do. And it reminded me of being back in the classroom, being a math teacher, story problems are where you gather all the information and come up with a logical solution. And that's exactly what financial planning is as well, is gathering all the information and coming up with a, a logical solution to whatever the issue is at hand. And so that's kind of been my journey. Approximately, in par, approximately what year was that? Kind of when, when you went from, they saw the bookkeeping and the wealth management side and then decided the bell went off. R roughly what year was that? I would say about 2012. 
12. Okay, so it's been in the last just about 10 years ago. And then yeah. so we're, we're going to get into that in a second with Alpha Media and where you are now and what you're doing, because I think that will really interest the listeners as well. But I want to take a detour for a second. I probably should have put it in chrono chronological order, but I want to go back to uh, you talked about how we met on LinkedIn and you wrote an article uh, recently about your upbringing and certainly around Christmas and gifts and money. And so step back a little bit and, and kind of talk a little bit about what you wrote in that article specifically around Christmas, but also about giving and growing up in not the best circumstances. And then certainly at some point, how that impacted you to be grateful for what you had, considering you didn't have a lot. Talk about that a little bit. So I, I did have very humble beginnings. And for probably the first 20 years of my life, I was pretty angry and bitter about it. Um, I was... I was the product of two teenage parents. Uh, they tried to get married or they got married. The marriage didn't work and they were divorced by the time I was six months old. Um, I went into foster care at that time and my father was in the military. My mother just was MIA. Um, she was deemed an, a, an unfit mother and lost custody of me. And um, I, I never heard from her again. Um, my father, on the other hand, he was in the military, so he was away, stationed away, and about when I was two years old, his parents came and got me out of foster care. Um, they were military also, so prior to that, they couldn't come get me because they were stationed overseas. Um, I grew up, that was supposed to be a temporary situation where I was supposed to stay with them until my father got his life together, and um, they had very, very, well, it, it was generational poverty, um, just generation after generation after generation, there was never enough money. Um, I, I knew at that time, well, the older I got, I knew I was a financial burden on them. Um, it became very obvious to me that I was very much a financial burden on them. But anyway, my father couldn't get his life together. He would show up about every four years and say, oh, you're my little princess. You're my little darling. I love you, blah, blah, blah. And it was all words. And then he would disappear in the middle of the night, literally in the middle of the night, he would leave. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't hear from him for like four years. Um, and so I, I grew up very confused as to why I was even on this planet. It was like, as a child, you don't understand what's going on in the adult lives. And all you can think of is, well, my mother doesn't want me, my father doesn't want me. And then this house that I've been brought into, it was very abusive as well. And so I just, I, I didn't understand why I was even put on this planet. Um, the one thing though, that was my saving grace in that time was I had a grandmother the grandmother that raised me, she only had a sixth grade education. Um, and so there were a lot of misinformation wives tales that I grew up on. But anyway, regardless of all her parenting mistakes, I knew that she loved me unconditionally. And that gave me a little bit of hope that um, maybe my life was worth something. I didn't know what. Um, but anyway, just just growing up in that environment, I just felt like an unwanted child. And then I was a burden on my grandparents. And it, and even to the point where when I was 18 years old, my grandparents had said, told my father that, you know, you haven't come for her. So we want to adopt her. And he just said, no, he, he mm -hmm. wouldn't sign the adoption papers. My mother still had never shown up. Um, and I was like, okay, I'll sign them myself. And so I ended up signing my own adoption papers oh, wow. when I turned 18, you know? And so I had this hope. I always believed in a higher power, but I got confused on the religious beliefs. Um, I didn't quite understand how it all fit together, but I sure as hell didn't believe that there was somebody up there trying to take care of me. Mm -hmm. And I, I just felt like if anyone's going to take care of me, I have to take care of myself. Um, and I don't know that that's the healthiest way of looking at things, but it made me go try to become something because I, I lost hope that anyone was going to try to take care of me. So I just assumed the responsibility for myself that, okay, so I've got to do this. And so I, I know growing up too, not having that, 
ideal family situation. Anytime I went over to a friend's house, I was very, very aware of how the parents treated each other and how they treated their children. Um, and I, I, I was very aware of how women in particular, the mothers would behave and how some of them had careers and some of them didn't. And so I feel like I formulated this idea of what I wanted to be by just constantly analyzing every everybody's parents that I had contact with. Um, and I feel like I've gotten off topic, but. <laughs> well, that's okay. Actually, but I'll bring it back to something too you said, because I always think about listeners to the podcast or anything where we're doing posting on LinkedIn or articles or whatever it might be, uh, speeches, videos, and that is, is how many people can relate to what something that somebody that has just said. And you said, why was I even on the planet? I remember asking myself that a number of times, particularly in my mid twenties, when I'd been through college and I've done everything you're supposed to do. Well, gosh, why am I really here? So how did you end up answering that? Because that's certainly with, and I knew a little bit of your backstory, but thank goodness for your grandmother. Here she is with a sixth grade education and she's taking care of Dee Dee and so on. But how did you end up answering that? Or where, where did you sort of find some? And then I always ask too, if gratitude is a piece of it and being grateful for what we have versus we don't have you, su you yeah, suffered from a lot of things when you were younger to say the least and but how did you end up seeking out or finding out that answer for yourself honestly it took decades um i i i met my husband when i was 14 we didn't get we weren't together as a couple at that time but we started dating when i was 17 we married it when i was 19 and honestly his well and my my grandmother actually passed when i was 20 so it was like it was just bam, bam, bam. I got married or I signed my adoption papers. I got married the following year. We got pregnant with our first daughter. And the um, day that I brought my daughter home from the hospital, my grandmother passed away. Oh, wow. That so was like, you know, I was still at that point, I was very grateful for my child. Um, I always had wanted to be a mother, um, but I was pretty angry that is at God actually saying, you know what? I didn't have a real mother. My biological mother has never been part of my life. And then the only mother that I've ever known was taken from me at the age of 20. And then here I was a mother holding this brand new two day old baby. And then I'm on my own again. And so I, I was, I was really, really angry at God. I, I really was. And I cried and I was, ah, I was just so angry. That's the best way I could put it. But my husband and his family stood by me this whole time. Mm -hmm. And they would say, it's going to be okay. You know, my mother-in-law stepped in and tried to be that you know maternal figure that would help raising, you know, help give advice on raising a daughter. And finally, it all came to a head when my daughter was, I'd say about a year and a half, my mother-in-law sat me down and said, you know what, you, you have had a traumatic past. You really need some outside help. Mm -hmm. And um, she, I, I agreed to go to counseling. I didn't think I needed it because I thought I was fine, but I agreed to go to counseling. And I spent seven years with a counselor trying to untangle this web of anger and frustration and hurt and feeling like just... I didn't get it. I mean, and I wanted to scream out to God so many times, why, why am I even here? Being a mother gave me a purpose. Yeah. And so at that point in my life, once I became a mother, I no longer had thoughts of that. Maybe I would end it someday. I, I truly wanted to live after um, having a daughter. And then just year after year after year, my husband's being by my side, he would go to counseling with me. Um, and this, it took me 10 years of being married before I truly accepted that my husband truly loved me. Now, this man is as much of a saint as you can be as far, I mean, he's never done anything to make me think, you know, I wasn't the only one in his life. He's always been faithful. He's always been loving, caring, um, I pushed him away emotionally, but it was like it took 10 years of marriage for me to understand that I was lovable and, and that I could accept being loved. And it's like around that point, after all the years of counseling, I then I also had another child in there, our second daughter. It just took 
years and years and years of my husband's unconditional love, being a mother and being the mother that I craved for so long and having these beautiful little babies that I started feeling like, okay, this is why I'm here. I'm here to be the mother and the wife and to love as many people as possible. And in my healing, you know, I started realizing that trying to become the mother that I always craved, I just had this abundance of love to give to everyone, not only my own children, but to my school children. Um, and then it expanded when I left the classroom, it, it became, I want to love my clients too. And so um, I just, I, somewhere in there, I had to start looking at what was going well in my life. And I'm so glad that I opened my eyes when I did and saw that I had a wonderful marriage. I had two beautiful babies. Um, I had, you know, I was, I, I had career, you know, very successful careers. I had what everybody says ex is successful. And I had to start really telling myself that, you know, what happened before that's who shaped you into who you are, but you've got to start appreciating what you have right. because life just wasn't as sweet when I didn't appreciate things. And I felt like that kind of snowballed. The more I appreciated what I had, the more grateful that I was. Um, I, I just started seeing that more and more things were I was grateful for. And then, yeah, so it's taken, it's taken years and years and years and so it's I feel like I've trained my brain to just focus in on the good in life um and it's just made my life so much sweeter well and it's such a great story of survival and resilience and I think that when you just mentioned uh you know, sort of take inventory of your life. And sometimes it's really bad. And then you mentioned, gosh, I've got this great marriage. I know a ton of people that don't have good marriages. I know a lot of people don't have kids. You have two great daughters and so forth. But it's interesting to me when I think about coping mechanisms, and you mentioned seven years with a counselor and you kind of resisted going, but then you went and that slowly helped you over time. And as you look back on this, and what would you say, and, and oh, and one more comment you just said that just made me think of it is, at least this is just my feeling, but you really can't appreciate somebody's role until you play it yourself. And in this case, a parent. And so being the father of two wonderful young men, uh, sometimes I get irritated with my parents in certain ways, but I can just see in your situation, once you became a parent, I'm sure you had to look at your mom and go, what were you thinking? I'm a great daughter. I mean, it's like, because once you're a parent, it's like, are you kidding? I'd throw myself in front of a train to save my sons. You know, so what was your mom thinking? But, you know, you can't worry about that. There's certain people that maybe they weren't designed to be parents. And sometimes the children have to become the parents and so forth. But through that journey, Dee, what was, was there a central coping mechanism? Was there one or two things that you always relied on? Or were there different things over time that were your best coping mechanisms? Um, Honestly, the blessing and the curse at the same time was I was not being raised by biological parents. Mm. I was being raised by grandparents most of my life, and I knew I didn't have to be one of them. I always daydreamed about a life that was better because, mm. you know, our situation, even though I had a loving grandmother, you know, our situation was pretty messed up. We lived in a little two bedroom trailer house on the end of town. There were no street lights or anything. And it was roach infested and just not all the needs, not all the basic needs were taken care of. Right. Um, and so I knew at a very early age, I did not want to live this way. I did not want to, you know, I did not want my life to look like this. And I daydreamed about having a mother out there who had never contacted me. And by the way, I found out later in life that she was actually killed in a car accident when okay. I was six years old. So that's part of why she never came back for me. Oh, wow. Um, but I, I just, I had these very, very vivid daydreams of what I wanted my life to be. Um, and I dreamed that my mother was going to, you know, me, my mother and I would reunite and she, she would tell me, oh my gosh, I missed you so much. I missed you as much as you missed me. And I, you know, I had just these fantasies in my head and I feel like those fantasies are what gave me hope. Now, a lot of times people talk about, you know, manifesting what you want in life. I didn't know what manifesting was, but I, I believe that that's what I was doing was I was creating, creating this life in my mind that I wanted and my life has turned out really well 
you know, by the constant daydreaming of what could be, not what was. I like that. I really like that. And I want to ask you in a minute too about a few pointers or maybe tips for somebody that maybe has gone through something similar to yours. And I've actually written down a couple we'll come to, but I'll get back to that in a second. But I'll, I'll, I'll use that when we wrap up. But I want to spend five or six minutes on Alpha Media and because your life is, is taking so many twists and turns and it's the old roller coaster of life up and down and dips and turns and, and good and bad and, and the blessing and the curse, as you just mentioned. But talk a little bit about what you've done with Alpha Media because I think that's your current uh, business. And I just think it's fantastic. And I give you a ton of credit for not only surviving your upbringing, but then putting something together, which takes a lot of guts. It's so simple to sit and work for the man or the woman, if you will, and get a check every other Friday and just put up with it and, and uh, know that I can't talk to Dee for in five minutes. My boss will get mad at me. You know, there's always that kind of thing. So talk about how that evolved and, and tell the listeners a little bit about how, what you put together for Alpha Mita. Okay. So I also want to, as, as part of the survivor journey or, you know, overcoming journey, I feel like I have worked hard at, in my adult life at surrounding myself with people who motivate me, help me, or in some form or fashion, or, you know, and help me heal. Um, my family, my core unit, my husband and my daughters and my daughter-in-law are in the, in the very core of that. But I've also surrounded myself with people that I admire that help, like, you know, business coaches. I, I work with someone who's a spiritual healer. Um, you know, marketing coaches. I So I surround myself with very intelligent, helpful people. So it's not just me that is, you know, succeeding. I, I, I feel like I have an army of people who have helped. So Alpha Meta, um, like I said, I was at a credit union. I had way too many clients. I couldn't give them the service that I wanted. And the pandemic hit and it just made me think about okay, what do I truly want to do in life? And I, I want to help people. And my gifts are in the area of math and uh, relationships. So um, I decided to go ahead and go off on my own. Um, and I started what's called an RIA. So I don't have a broker dealer telling me that I have to do things a certain way, or I have to say things a certain way. And this was on purpose. I wanted to do things my way. Um, so the word Alpha Meta is actually um, three words combined, and it, it's Alpha, female, and then Donita. And Donita is my given name, but that's also the grandmother that raised me. I was named after her. So I wanted to um, somehow, you know, pay tribute to her in the name. So Alpha, female, Donita. And that, that's why there's an E on the end of Alpha. Um, it's Alphem. Um, for alpha female and then Donita. Um, so the firm that I wanted to create, I wanted it to be relationship oriented and I wanted it to be able to serve clients, you know, all around. I wanted to be able to take care of all their needs. Um, and the way this came about was about five years ago, I had a client uh, who had inherited a large sum of money and um, she, she was one that had always, <clears throat> excuse me, lived paycheck to paycheck. <clears throat> and um, anyway, we started working together and she'd never worked with a financial advisor. We established this bond. And so she trusted me and, and I took care of her the best I could. And we got into helping her settle her mother's estate and then having to do her own taxes. And that was something I couldn't do. I had to send her away to get help. And she had anxieties tied around this and she kept saying, could you just please do this for me? And I was like, I don't, I don't have the credentials. So I kept that in mind when I opened my own firm. I wanted to be able to offer services that I could be right there with my client through all of it. So I offer financial planning. I offer uh, advisory services. And of course, those two are my area. But then I also offer tax preparation and tax planning, where I partner with another company that provides the EA or the CPA. And I'm in on the discussions on the appointments with my clients if they want me to be. Now they can be they can meet with them alone if they they so choose. But the majority of my clients want me there. And so that way I can say, you know, bring up things that they may have forgotten. And they don't have to come back and regurgitate to me what the CPA 
you know, told them. So right. um, anyway, that has been very nice. And then I also have that service for estate planning. So setting up the wills, the or wills or trust and doing an estate plan. Um, I have partnered with a company that can do all those services as well with me being there. So my, it brings, at least the clients that I have, it brings them comfort knowing they've got someone there on their behalf that can speak up if, if needed. And then finally, I also offer a bill pay service. Um, there are a few of my clients that they're just like, mm, I just don't want to think about the money part. Just tell me what I need to do and do it. So I offer bill pay also. So my my biggest package is a, you know, a gold level package where I provide all of the services just for a flat fee. Nice, so, nice. Well, that's good. And I really, like I said, I really wanted to kind of focus on that now because I know in the LinkedIn group that we're part of is that's all about building your business and its referrals and getting, finding people through LinkedIn and clients and, and so on and so forth. And coming back to a little bit, I, I, because of your journey, and I made a couple of notes here, but what would be if somebody has gone through or is going through sort of what you have, and I have two or three, but I want to see if there's others you might mention, just little bits of advice or tips that you might say, here's a way that you could help cope. Because I know there's listeners out there and viewers that are always, there's just enough people out there that have suffered and struggled. And what would you tell them in terms of here are some things to keep you going or to keep you motivated, to keep pushing forward? What, what sort of thoughts or advice would you give them? I, I would go back to surround your, yourself with people who can help you get to the next level. I, really I like think you that. need to look at what terrible situations you came from, acknowledge them, feel the feelings. It's okay to feel angry, to feel hurt, to feel ashamed. I have felt all those emotions and I know a lot of people have too. It's perfectly fine to acknowledge where you've come from and keep it in mind, but your focus needs to be how to heal. You know, and how to heal looks different for all of us. Mine, I do a lot of writing and journaling. Um, the, I've talked to other people who need to actually uh, talk it through with other people. Um, you know, there's just a lot of mechanism, mechanisms out there that are in place that you can use, but your focus needs to be on healing you. Yeah. Um, and that needs to be a priority. And that's something with the soul-based financial planning that I do, um, I believe that that needs to be the center of the financial planning is we need to figure out who you are, what makes you happy, what are your struggles with money, what's your relationship with money. All of this goes into it before we put it down on paper with the numbers, because the numbers don't mean much if you can't follow through on them because you have this maybe trauma in your background that you may be repeating certain cycles or punishing yourself um, on a subconscious level where money is concerned. So I feel like we need to get into deep who you are as a person, how you can heal and how you can move forward. But your focus always needs to be on healing and moving forward. And, you know, I think that's interesting, too, because you've mentioned uh, going to a counselor and therapy seven years, and, and most of us have experienced some form of counseling or therapy over the years. And I used to say people spend more money tuning up their car than they do tuning up their own brain. But I mm. think in getting to know you and talking about this uh, over the last several months, it, it almost wouldn't surprise me if, if you find out that well, the reason that people can't sleep at night is money, and then they try to get back to sleep and they worry about money. The number one reason people get divorced is money. And then I think I mentioned to you the other day, the second divorce or second marriage is stepchildren, which is interesting, but money was number four. But there's money, and it's almost like I'm surprised, and maybe there are, there aren't more counselors out there that just specialize in money. Because mm -hmm. that was a great point about what is your relationship with money? What makes you happy? And understanding that and you and I have even talked off air about how it's changed for me and sort of matured and grown. And sometimes our relationship with money in the early years is just way out of whack. You know, go now, pay later, forget the future, just get instant gratification today. And who cares if you have bills, you know, from stacked high and so forth. So, so that's really good. So I, this is what I looked at. And then I'm going to ask you one last question. We'll wrap up in a couple of minutes, but I really liked some of the points. And again, thinking about people that have gone through a similar journey, I know there's people out there that have had it, you know, relatively easy and we're not really addressing them. I'm happy for them and, and mm -hmm. they were blessed and that's excellent. But for those that went through something kind of rough, I really like that uh, daydreaming about a life that could be better because that's really like um, 
sort of that imagination or planning or projecting, or there's a number of words to describe that uh, to see your future. And the gratitude journalists, I call it gratitude intentions, gratitude for tomorrow. You're actually writing what's going to happen and it hasn't mm -hmm. even happened yet, but you're sort of programming your brain. And that was a great point. And then fantasies give, gave me hope. And I thought that was sort of that same idea of just picturing that maybe it's a fantasy, but look, as you've gone further and chipped away at this brick by brick, look where you are and look at the life you have now versus the life that you came from. And then you mentioned this a couple of times, but it's so good surrounding yourself with people that help me heal, coaches, healers, and various people that just um, it's kind of that, I, I know it gets trite, but, but play with a better tennis player, find out somebody who's doing better than you find out somebody that's getting results that you want to get and then do what they do and listen to them and so forth. And so, uh, and then the last couple too, which you just mentioned, which I think are so cool. Um, what is your relationship with money and really understanding that? And I think I heard something that I, I don't want to quote the exact number, but the credit card debt and the United States is a trillion dollars or something like that. And so talk about relationship with the money. When I was growing up, we didn't have credit cards that could buy anything you want. There was a Texaco card and a Chevron card for gas, and stuff, <laughs> but they didn't have this card that could get you whatever you want. And we know how that's changed. And then, as you said, and this, this is maybe the most important of all of them is what makes you happy. And then when you answer that question to try to, to figure out some of the pieces that, that are around that. So, so the last question that I always wrap up with, because it's just been so instructive to me over the years, but if we take you from where you are now and think about what you know today, and I know there's many things, but what would you like to tell your 18 year old self? What do you know today that would have been helpful for you to know at 18 if you could only pick one thing? Keep fighting, it's gonna be worth it. Keep fighting, it's going to be worth it. I totally agree. And you know, just as an adjunct to that, I saw something the other day, I can't remember if it was quoted to, um, I want to say Martin Luther King, I'm not positive, but they said, think of it as a car driving through the road in the night. If you notice the headlights go out about 200 yards or how far the headlights go, you know, that's all you need to worry about. Just, you know, keep fine. Just worry about the 200. Don't worry about what's five miles down the road because you're not there yet. But I right. thought that was a great analogy about just focusing on what is just in that first 200 yards and, and keep fighting. It's going to be worth it. And then just chip away. So Excellent. Well, Miss Bayes, thank you so much. I do appreciate you being on the show. I think there were some great value bombs, as I heard somebody say once, which I really like. So <laughs> I think that's great from Dee Dee Bayes. So once again, thank you listeners and viewers. And as a reminder, my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. And it's available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. And as I mentioned earlier, please give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. And I know that people are struggling with a lot of life issues. We just talked about that with Dee Dee and some of the things she went through. I do have a program for you. It's called my Gratitude Coaching Program, which will give you a coach that fully believes in you and can propel you forward to achieve anything your mind can conceive. The support you receive is unmatched in getting you to believe in you and make changes that you've been wanting and needing to make. Whether it's your finances, your relationships, your career, or your life's journey that you want to change, and this program will work for you. Gaining a complete understanding of your challenges, asking powerful questions, providing guidance, and a very high level of accountability, along with an attitude of gratitude, all combined to ensure your personal success. My four-month proprietary coaching program is available for my podcast listeners, and if you get it through the podcast and mention it on the podcast, you get two extra months of coaching for free. So for more information about that or my keynote speaking and my coaching and any other of the gratitude journals and so forth, you can reach me at thatgratitudeguide.com, as I mentioned. Also, I'm excited to tell you about a new app that I am part of for those that are interested in apps for gratitude. It's called the KS Media Group, and it features the world's best podcasters and influencers. Simply go to the App Store and download the KS Media Group app. You can then sign up for a free account to gain access to all your various influencers and connect with yours truly on I'm on there. And also we're looking for entrepreneurs who are making positive changes in our world and want to join the group as well. So, and one last thing, if you'd like to get my Monday morning minute, which is my 60 second video that goes out every Monday morning to inspire people and get them started for the week. You can get that by texting the number 22828, that's five digits, 22828, and in the message box, put in Gratitude Guy, and that will get you signed up. So lastly, thank you so much for tuning in. I so appreciate the listeners and viewers, 
And as I always say, remember, I'm that gratitude guy. And remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us. And you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.